Brian Beeler coming to you from the Storage Review Lab. And today we're taking a look at QSAN's latest array. It's a XS3312 appliance. Now this is a very common 2U 12 drive form factor that's available in both a D and S model. The D having dual controllers, which is this one, and the S just being a single controller uh, variety. This is a SAS unit. The single controller can support SATA drives as well. But with expansion, and if you were to use 22 terabyte hard drives, you'd be looking at almost 500 drives available and over 10 petabytes of storage. If though you want something a little smaller, QSAN has systems that go all the way down to six bays, and they've got larger in this family that go up to 24 bays. But again, with 20 JBODs for any of those systems, you get a tremendous amount of storage. Of course, this unit supports fiber channel and ethernet, also giving more flexibility to small businesses looking to deploy these anywhere in the organization. But for any of these systems going out to a small business, usability and manageability is key. So let's take a look at the GUI and learn a little bit more about how that operates. All right, so Kevin's joining me now to take a quick tour through the GUI. And just as soon as we pull this thing up, it looks visually appealing at least, right? Yeah, it's pretty nice. I mean, this is the type of interface that would work well on a PC or tablet or even a cell phone, really. Um, <laughs> well, although there, There's not too many administering from an iPhone, but I suppose you could if you want to. No, but let's say something breaks middle of the night, you might have your phone at, uh, at your nightstand or something and be able to VPN in and hit it that way. So it's, it's nice to, to have that, but uh, you probably don't want to use that as your first line of defense. All right, so at a high level, we can see activity on the system, storage consumed, and that all of our uh, bays are green. Yeah, and we can, uh, this is nice, where a lot of the newer storage arrays, uh, they'll give you some historical data at the first landing page just to kind of see how things have been going in a snapshot. Here, uh, you get to view the last hour of activity. In this case, we can kind of see what the uh, uh, transaction, oh, the response time is for the different workloads, and then well, that's the latency field. We have IOPS and then also uh, throughput. And it just, it gives you a nice indication. Let's say if you log in because something is amiss, you could say, okay, well, the box is being thrashed right now or some, uh, some apparent reason. Uh, or just, hey, you want to see how things are going as uh, you're deploying some new volumes and you get an idea of how the box is saturated. So past the main screen here, where else were you spending most of your time? So uh, most of our time was spent in the storage space. I mean, we, not that there was a lot of it setup required, but it was more of a we're creating pools, we're creating volumes, uh, we're deleting volumes, we're provisioning that out to our uh, uh, VMware cluster. But it's pretty easy in this uh, platform. So right now we have uh, two pools created, uh, and you can kind of see that uh, one pool is on controller one, the other pool is on uh, controller two. So your two options are one giant pool with one controller accessing that with the other controller being a failover. But if you want more performance, like we did here, two smaller pools with each controller uh, addressing each pool independently and thus getting you know, twice your theoretical performance. Yeah, and it's also important to remember while 12 bays might get uh, thin, getting split out between uh, two controllers, you can attach expansion shelves. So realistically, it may affect some people, but um, if you're looking for the peak performance, you're going to leverage both controllers. If you're looking maybe for just peak capacity and some resiliency for failover, I mean, you could probably just load it up on just one controller and let that uh, system manage it for if something fails and needs to move over or during maintenance mode where um, you're updating firmwares and balancing between that, uh, that type of activity. But for here, we get, uh, we get to see the, uh, the volumes we created and... Uh, Snapshot space uh, consumed for each. In this case, we have uh, two. T we have eight uh, two terabyte uh, volumes. There's uh, four uh, per a uh, pool, and you can see the snapshot space consumed. Um, you can edit certain properties on these for um, what type of uh, cache, write through, write back. Since these are all flash, we're leveraging just write through cache on the uh, platform. The, the SSDs are probably going to fa be faster than the cache of the controller, so that's a pretty common thing just to uh, pass through for that. Um, and, I mean, creating a new volume is really easy. You uh, can edit uh, the name if you want to, change the capacity, give it, uh, if your units are being gigabytes or terabytes, then you can also change block size. Here, if you're leveraging, the, if you're deploying this to uh, Linux or Windows, you, don't, you can 
kind of be more, um, uh, you can go for a larger block size for larger volumes with VMware, you still want to stick with uh, 5 to wide for compatibility in that, uh, for that. And then you change your host group to uh, allow it to uh, connect uh, to different hosts. I mean, this is a basic fiber channel uh, type of uh, provisioning step, but it's really easy. I mean, for the average, um, and we end up using the rest of the space, for the average sysadmin that uh, might be working in a small business that it's the sysadmin of many hats, you don't really have to be a pro and have to go through a course just to know how to leverage the platform. It's a pretty easy thing to pick up and work as you go. Yeah, so you're probably working with a partner to deploy this, uh, but it, you, if you're the IT generalist, you should be able to uh, work in here without causing too much trouble. Yeah. And then as uh, we go through here, here we get to see our host, group, uh, host groups and uh, you get to see the different target names for uh, the devices. And then you can drill into the different um, volume provision. Here you can see that massive 12 terabyte uh, LUN that we presented out at the end that used all the remaining space on that uh, pool. But it gives you a basic area to, let's say you wanted to change the uh, LUN ID for a uh, given volume after the fact change through here, or maybe you're changing which hosts are allowed to access the, uh, uh, the given volumes, you can change that through here as well. And then you can also change the protection groups. I mean, this is fairly basic uh, block storage type of protection schemes. You create snapshots to uh, handle some, not say backup, but some onboard resiliency for a whoopsie, or someone accidentally deleted something you need to recover. Uh, your frontline recovery process. Uh, backups obviously be doing that through a different storage uh, device, but uh, snapshots are a fairly easy way to handle what most admins would call a recovery process on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Then you can drill in through the analysis uh, stage for uh, looking at uh, historical performance on uh, uh, different volumes. And I mean, this would be an area where say you ran into a weird performance issue at a given day and you had some alerts going, you could drill back to that particular day and a given volume to a certain host and see, hey, maybe activity was really high what was, or just a was an error present or something like figuring out what happened. And then on the uh, system stage, you, get to, you can kind of hover over your uh, different, uh, the front view and rear view of the uh, system. And this is pretty useful just to figure out like, hey, a drive failed, what drive failed and pull out that particular drive. Or a bad port, right, if you lose one of your fiber connections or something, right? Yeah, or say the system is a couple of years in, you've been doing some right, uh, right intensive activity, what's life remaining on a given drive? Or is maybe one drive singled out on um, uh, performance uses, but it gives you a pretty good indication of uh, overall health of the system. And then on the back side, you can see the power supplies, those are normal, the fan modules, those are going pretty well. Um, and then also the uh, SAS ports, your management ports, this way um, you can see what the uh, current uh, static IP address information is, and then you can have hover over on your uh, fiber channel ports to see the uh, connected speed, things like that. And our SAS ports aren't used, but you would use those for the expander shelves, right? Yes. And then uh, general settings, um, and this is pretty common stuff, setting date time, uh, handling configuration backup. Uh, maybe changing the uh, management port right now for our lab deployment. We just use DHCP, but obviously might we leveraging uh, static IP in a normal environment. This uh, unit ships with uh, DHCP on by default, uh, just for easy getting it up and running, and then you can change it over uh, once you get uh, your initial access. And they also have a utility, so when the unit fires up for the first time, you might not know what the DHCP address is, or you don't want to drill into your router, you can fire up a little client on your uh, Windows system or I think maybe even Mac to um, find it in the uh, network and then connect onto it that way. And then general settings for iSCSI and uh, fiber channel ports. And then what's kind of cool is for maintenance, uh, you get access to firmware for um, the main head unit and expansion units, as well as um, let's say your disk vendor gave you a firmware update you don't want to pull those drives out to update in a secondary system, you can push the updates in through the, uh, the internet itself. So it's, it covers all the basic things you'd want to cover for a, um, a normal sysadmin process, and it's, it's pretty easy to use. 
Well, you mentioned the fiber channel. Why don't we take a look at the performance there and see how those uh, volumes did over fiber and learn a little bit more about its capabilities. Okay. So quickly, we configured this with four hosts over 16 gig fiber and you ran some RAID 10 and RAID 6 work uh, on this array. Yeah, and our um, the way we leveraged four hosts, uh, we had uh, four hosts each connected over 32 gig fiber going back to a 32 gig switch. Although this unit, uh, the way it was configured, we were leveraging 16 gig fiber, so eight ports of 16 gig coming out and we had eight gigs of 32 on the uh, host side. So 64K uh, sequential read, uh, we capped out at uh, just under 4,500 uh, megabytes per second. Now we did see higher performance from uh, RAID 6 than we did uh, RAID 10, but uh, performance was uh, pretty strong. So the uh, top performance we got out of uh, RAID 10 t uh, was just under 4.5 gigabytes per second, uh, and then it peaked out at the very top. Uh, RAID 6 also came in the, the 44, 4500 megabytes per second range, although had slightly uh, greater performance through the entire latency profile. So when we look at 64K uh, sequential write, we also saw strong performance from both RAID 6 and RAID 10. Both in this area, both got over 60 uh, gigabytes per second. And roughly, you're not going to see much performance delta between the two configurations there. With random 4K read performance, we did see strong performance from both RAID 10 and RAID 6 uh, configurations. Uh, RAID 10 had a slight edge with uh, 340,000 IOPS, where RAID 6 came in with around uh, 330,000 IOPS. As you can see, both lines are pretty much consistent up until the very peak, so you're probably not going to see a huge differential uh, depending on how you deploy this for a uh, pure read environment. Now, as we look at the last data sample in this uh, video, we uh, were comparing 4K random read performance between RAID 6 and RAID 10. RAID 10 obviously offered uh, much greater uh, write performance, capping out around 300,000 IOPS versus RAID 6 with uh, right under 150,000 IOPS. Now, you're going to see this across really any storage provider. Uh, RAID 6 is going to have a much higher write overhead than uh, RAID 10, uh, and that's a trade-off between capacity provision versus... Uh, just RAID configuration in, in general. So this is a sample of the data. We've got a full report out on the website that has more information, more data charts, and, and all the details on configuration. So we gave you an overview of the GUI and the performance of the system using the Seagate Nitro SAS SSDs. Will everyone put all flash in this thing? Probably not. You're gonna see mostly a hybrid deployment with a little bit of flash, a little bit of hard drives, but you could do it any way you want, just depending on what the business needs are. We talked a little bit about expansion. The system can go up to 500 drives, which should handle most data needs. And the controllers, while ours is configured with just eight gig, which is the baseline, you can even jam 256 gig of uh, DRAM into each controller if you really wanted to goose the performance further. So overall, it's got a GUI that makes the system very easy to deploy and manage if you're going to be doing that on your own versus through a, uh, a partner of some sort. And the Seagate Nitro SAS drives inside provide adequate performance for small business needs. Overall, this QSAN does what they've continued to do in our Storage View Lab, and that's provide good performance at a reasonable price point while also being super simple to manage. That combination makes this a really good entry for small businesses, remote offices, and other places where that combination of cost, manageability, and performance is key. We continue to be impressed by the QSAN offerings and look forward to seeing what they have next.